All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, attending this talk. Uh, sorry that it's in English. I can do some Russian, but very, very small, <laughs> very tiny. So let, let's keep it in English. Anyway, um, just one thing. I, I am Spanish. I'm from Spain. And it's uh, 4 p.m., which means just after lunch, literally, just finished lunch. And this typically means siesta time, which means I'm sleepy. So pardon me for any mistakes I may make during the presentation. All right, so um, quick question. Who here uses MongoDB? Raise hands. I mean, I, OK, a few of you. What about Postgres? OK, what about the rest? OK, at least not sleeping like me. Good. <laughs> Thank you for that. So this, this presentation is, I hope, an interesting reference for you to understand the performance of two of the main uh, considered open source databases with a small asterisk in the case of MongoDB uh, because of the licensing change. And, uh, but anyway, uh, one of the most popular definitely uh, relation, uh, re databases, relational and no relational document database, um, and it provides a perspective of performance. Uh, why, why performance? Uh, why not compare feature set? Well, there's there's many options to compare also the features and the feature set about the between the two different databases. But most people, probably even most of you, often ask for performance. Which one is faster? And this is a decision factor for many. Um, it's not the only one, obviously, and it should not be. And if anything, all these numbers, all these conclusions that I'll be showing today might be totally different for your use case. So don't take this as a hard truth and say, oh, you know, because Alvar shown these numbers, this is faster or this is better or let's go for this. You always need to analyze A, performance applied to your own use case, and B, what other features are you caring about? And that will help you, you know, make a better decision. But if anything, this should enlighten, this should provide you data, should provide you uh, a way to be able to you know, have some more uh, information about how to decide which system you might want to use in the future or continue using if that's the case. So this is the main topic of this, of this talk. I'll, I hope it will be interesting. So let me a little bit introduce myself first place. Um, here's my, my coordinates. Uh, you, can, you can check uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, email. Reach me out anytime if you have any further questions or want to follow up on this. Um, I founded and I'm, uh, I run a company called Ongress, which means on Postgres. And this already reveals that we are Postgres experts, which probably means that this talk is already totally biased. Um, we are Postgres experts. But we know, we know MongoDB very well, too. Uh, we don't claim to be MongoDB experts, but we know very well. Why? Because one of the main goals we have in Ongress is to do R&D. We want to innovate, want to disrupt the database market. And for such, we try to come up with uh, some crazy stuff, crazy ideas. Like, for example, some years ago, we published a project called BTP, which stands for Billion Tables Project, where we explored how many tables you can create on a Postgres database. Sounds stupid, maybe, but we created more than a billion tables inside a Postgres database. They were empty, and that resulted in six terabytes of metadata, but we did it, right? Um, we also created another project called ToroDB, which is a software that replicates in real time from MongoDB to Postgres. Behaves like a MongoDB replica, but transform live the documents in MongoDB to relational tables on Postgres, like if a DBA would creating those tables for you. It creates tables and columns dynamically, data types, and adjusts the documents that you have in MongoDB to Postgres. So because of this, we claim to have you know, good knowledge of MongoDB and data replication techniques and performance. Um, and we ran a lot of performance benchmarking on ToroDB, which shown that it could be as much as 300 times faster than MongoDB for analytical queries back in the time. Things may have changed, and we'll also talk about performance today. But at least, you know, we, we've done this before, so we know what we're talking about. And, well, last but not least, I do a lot of uh, community work. I'm a well-known member of the Postgres community, I would say, and I speak very frequently. Um, this is my third or fourth time in here in High Load, and uh, next year I'll, I'll make a milestone of hitting 100 talks I've been delivered in the last years. So you, you find me traveling a lot. Anyway, 
enough about myself. So let's, let's talk about this, this benchmarking. So first of all, I already said that, you know, we are potentially biased. I'm potentially biased here. Yet uh, this work th that we did uh, to compare the performance of MongoDB and Postgres was a work that was requested by a company. So it was a paid for work. It was a sponsored by Enterprise DB, which is a Postgres company also. So how can we tell the world the story that this might be useful data, that this might be potentially fair and, and you know, objective comparison if A, we're a Postgres company, and B, it is sponsored by another Postgres company? Well, it sounds difficult, but, uh, and, and, and probably it's not totally fair, but we adhere to a very strict ethics policy. And this policy we enforced throughout the life cycle of this project. And we do for any other project, but specifically for benchmarks. Um, so this policy basically says that uh, we need to adhere to a f uh, certain rules. Like, for example, we need to publish every, re every result. If we run some benchmark and we don't like the numbers for whatever reason, we still need to publish them. Second, it means that everything needs to be open. And everything, I'll detail later, everything, everything that you will see here is in the open. You can go and check the results by yourself. You can rerun the results by yourself. You can modify them and rerun them also by yourself. So it's totally transparent. And it also means that there's been a separation of concerns. The team who designed the benchmarks didn't write the benchmarks. And the team who write the bench wrote the benchmarks didn't uh, write the document and the reports. So um, there's, there's separations of concerns that has been part of this ethics policy. And as such, you know, we claim that is, this is as unbiased and fair as, as possible. And last but not least, the team, the, the company who sponsored this, did not have any influence whatsoever on the technologies used, the results, or the publication. Everything is, was just agreed, what is the scope, and then we did everything without further intervention. Now, we know that benchmarking is, is really hard. Um, benchmarking itself is hard, and anyone would claim that any given result is, is biased automatically because you're trying to, you know, it could be a micro benchmark, it could be a macro benchmark, you're benchmarking a particular scenario, so obviously results for another scenario are, are different and then it is, it is hard. But then benchmarking databases is even harder. First of all, because there are stateful components that require replication, they require disks, they require setup, they could require a lot of tuning, um, and, and they perform differently under different scenarios and different workloads. So it becomes even harder to, to benchmark databases. Now think that you need to benchmark two databases that are kind of from different worlds. Postgres are a relational database, MongoDB is a document database, uh, and they are used di very differently with different software, different programs. So it's even harder to, to bench, to bench uh, you know, these two different engines. So how, how really can we do this? And, and, and how it can create some fair results or useful results after all? Even the question is fair, like, can you really compare Postgres and MongoDB? Well, we'll try to, to provide an answer to that. Uh, but performance, as I mentioned before, is a key for many to make a decision. And so we, we try to provide this data, and we believe it's valuable. By, by the way, for your reference, this effort was no small effort. If you're thinking that this is just a couple of afternoons uh, running some, some pre-created benchmark and publishing some results, it wasn't the case. This was a team that involved, I did speak at more than seven people for more than six months. We run this on the Amazon Cloud and we have spent more than $40,000 on Amazon Cloud just on this benchmark. So at least we tried hard. Now, Again, how to try to accomplish this fairness? Well, first of all, it needs to be transparent. And transparent means to be everything is open. So first of all, we design an infrastructure as code, which means using a combination of technologies such that you can recreate exactly the same environment that we use for performing the test with commands. No, no, manual, no manual commands. 
uh, everything is committed on, the, on, a source, on a source code repository, which is public and is open source. So do you want to spend $40,000 on Amazon tomorrow? You can do that. Just go to our repo, clone it, run the commands, and you'll see the same numbers as we have, probably. Right? That's the intent, at least. Um, what else? We also had to write a benchmark. I said that these databases are very different beasts, very different worlds. It was hard to compare them. And, and for one of the tests that we wanted to run, we had to write our own benchmark. So what we did, publish the benchmark. Publish the source code of this, this benchmark that we wrote. So you think that this benchmark is unfair? Go and patch it. You run your own, change the parameters. It is all in the public. And last but not least, we published the results, all the results in CSB form. Um, you believe our conclusions are wrong? Go and check the results. Figure out by yourself and make your own conclusions. Numbers are there. There's more than four gigabytes of CSB files with all the results for all the hundreds of benchmarks that we run. I believe we cannot be more transparent than this. We might be wrong, but at least we are transparent. And these are the, the, the URLs. Um, if, if you miss them, yes, just the, go to our website, ongress.com, go to the blog section. This, there is a, a lengthy blog post published about this, links to everything. What else? Well, transparency is a key factor. But it's not all. If we would have run a single benchmark, a single workload, you might see, oh, you know, Postgres is better, Postgres is worse, Mongo is better, but you know, on this workload. What about this other one? Well, databases sometimes are used for OLTP purposes, sometimes are used more for analytics, sometimes are used in a different way. So we simulated several scenarios uh, targeting different workloads, and we measured all those. So actually, we'll have results for three categories. But then we also wanted to introduce what is close to real world workloads. You know, if we use, for example, a tool called PGBench that comes with Postgres to benchmark Postgres, well, um, that benchmarks things, but nobody uses a schema like that anymore, or even if uh, ever did. It is very simple workload. Or if we use YCSB, which is cool and works for both databases, kind of, um, well, data model of YCSB is uh, documents with one key and one value, uh, where the value is an opaque binary of 10 bytes. That's not a real data model that you use every day. Um, so it's not going to be, it's going to be worthless. That's not going to help you make a decision. And here, our aim is to help you make a decision. So we had to simulate data that looks like as close as possible that you would use tomorrow. For example, this benchmark that we wrote, I'll speak about that, the transaction benchmark, simulates a booking a ticket of an airline. Of course, simplified. But at least it tries to perform several operations in different ways, in a way that closer simulates how you would book a ticket on an airline. That is, in our opinion, more useful. And last but not least, try to create uh, configurations that are simulate uh, real production workloads. If, you know, basically tuning uh, the databases. Not much, because in reality people don't, at least in our experience, people who work with Postgres is not tuned a lot, but it definitely requires tuning. So we try to make this also, you know, the way that most people will find a reasonably great than the system. So what types of benchmark have we done? Three main categories. OLTP. OLTP is probably the, the most used ca use case for transactional databases, and that includes both Postgres and MongoDB, and so there's, there's a OLTP. For OLTP, we distinguish two scenarios, one with a very small database, which fits completely in memory in the system that we had, and one that is significantly larger and doesn't uh, fit in memory, to, to see how systems react differently to these patterns. Uh, then we also did an OLAP benchmark, which is more analytics, try to do aggregate queries and try to find results that you know, could serve purposes for, for marketing or for decision making based on all, all the data that, that, that there is present there. Um, and uh, last but not least, MongoDB 4.0 uh, came with uh, support for transactions, uh, multi-document transactions to be more precise. This support was not present before in MongoDB. Uh, and so we wanted to compare also the performance under the scenario where you are doing transactions on both systems, um, multi-document, multi-table uh, records uh, transactions. And, and so this is where we also had to write this own benchmark. All right, so 
fight. <laughs> who's on the left, who's on the right, pretty much uh, well known, so I'll just skip this fast, but this, we compared MongoDB 4.0 and Postgres 11. We compared in Postgres, the Postgres version, and in, for MongoDB we compared what is called the community version, uh, which is a, a free version that you can use. It's no longer open source, but it's free to use. Um, and uh, you know we, we, we could compare it uh, directly. Uh, the enterprise version of MongoDB uh, explicitly prohibits publishing benchmarks about it, so we obviously couldn't run that version, or at least not publish the numbers. Um, what else? So we had replication enabled. This is important because you know few of you would probably run a database without replication, uh, but um, it, it was targeting a single node because uh, that is not affecting performance other than that. But uh, at least replication should be enabled to, to simulate this scenario. This scenario. Um, Postgres 11. For comparing Postgres, we used PG Bouncer and without PG Bouncer, and I'll explain later why. So we used a, a connection pooling as, as an option. Um, MongoDB, we didn't do any, any uh, specific tuning of the database, and this is interesting. By the way, there were, this I don't know. This is an interesting question. Sorry to ask. Who has read our blog post about this? Anyone? Okay, couple there. And MongoDB blog post about this? I guess you too, too, definitely. Yeah, so it, it's been an interesting and I would say heated debate, this benchmark. When it was published by EnterpriseDB initially, um, a couple of weeks later, MongoDB responded with a blog post on, on their own uh, where they uh, considered that many things that I'm gonna explain to you today were wrong. Um, and, and we published a response explaining why we believe those were not that wrong uh, to say. Um, and it was a very interesting and heated debate. It was very enjoyable. Um, so one, one of the issues is, uh, is about MongoDB tuning. And um, what we found is that we followed the document that they have called production guidelines. And, uh, and you know, we followed that document, but it, basically there's not much to tune there. However, Postgres requires some, some tuning in order to work. So if you're more interested, uh, just, just go to our blog post. It explains the whys and the hows. So um, what is the benchmark setup? There was a client server architecture, a client running the benchmark server uh, with the database. We make sh made sure at all the times that the client was never saturated, so it was not a bottleneck for the benchmark. Um, all the benchmarks, by the way, with this infrastructure as code that was running, uh, used um, also included monitoring, so we cap captured uh, SAR traces of all the benchmarks so we could, we could actually measure uh, memory consumption and CPU consumption to make sure that, again, we were not saturating on the client side. The servers were not, not like super big iron, but neither is small. Again, we wanted to simulate kind of production workloads. So the server, we were talking about 16 core CPU with 64 gigabytes of RAM. Um, network disk, because it's what typically people use uh, in most setups. Uh, but at least good uh, network bandwidth. And client is just, uh, of course, a little bit smaller like four times smaller. Okay, so let's start with the benchmarks. First, transactions. This is the new thing that came with MongoDB 4.0, multi-document transactions. But before that, let's, let's digress a little bit into what, what are the isolation levels. So when we talk about ACID, you know, you know what ACID means, right? All right. So what about the I? The I is no, 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 you know, everybody talks about atomicity, which is the first property. Like you can, you can execute a group of operations uh, as a single unity, right? Either all of them succeed or none of them. Um, but isolation is often overlooked. And what it means, isolation? Isolation means that when you run several transactions concurrently, uh, you may experience some data effects on those transactions. You may observe temporary states of the execution of those uh, transactions, depending on, on the isolation levels. The, the SQL standard defines four main isolation levels which prevent or not prevent several effects that may happen on the database, which are represented on basically this, this table that you can, you can see here. So those effects are dirty reads, lost updates, non-readable reads, and phantoms. This is pretty well-known theory, and, and, and there's these four isolation levels. So basically, if you run on, on read and committed, then you may experience all these possible uh, failures. Uh, from, from the data perspective. If you run uh, on serializable isolation level, then you will experience none of them. Of course, the higher the isolation level, the potentially less performant database you will have, 
and then it's a trade-off between performance and the isolation that your operation may require. So how these isolation levels are mapped on, onto these di different databases. So Postgres does not support read and committed, which means that you will never experience dirty reads in Postgres. Um, this is permitted by the standard. The standard uh, asks for a minimum of isolation level. You can provide more isolation than that. MongoDB without transactions runs on uh, read and committed, so which means that you can experience dirty reads plus all the other uh, effects. And when it runs with transactions, multi-document transactions, then uh, it provides also serializable isolation levels. So, so pretty much the same in that case. Uh, there's nothing in between. So either you run uh, with dirty reads or you run uh, on serializable isolation level. Okay, so um, what is this benchmark? So this benchmark, again, there was nothing in the market that we found that could compare Postgres and MongoDB with transactions. We tried to modify the same benchmark that was available for OL, that we used for OLTP and add support for transactions, but we failed at that. It was complex. It didn't work very well for us. So we decided to write our own. To try to make this as fair as possible, we were inspired by a benchmark written by MongoDB. It was a, a Maybe a simple one, but it was a benchmark written to explicitly show and exercise the transactions, the transaction support MongoDB 4.0. So we took it to port, we ported to, to we ported it to, to Java, the language we were using, and we added support for Postgres. Um, the code is open source, so just just go to the repository in GitLab. You'll find source code there and the parameters. There's there's documentation on how to run it, which parameters it accepts, and you can also tune the isolation level that you may want to pick. Um, what it does, this program, is simulate, as I was telling before, um, airline ticketing reservation system. So basically, when you book an airline, a ticket on an airline, you need to check the flights which are available. Then you'll write, uh, uh, you update the, the seats in the plane to say there's one seat less. Then you'll write the ticket record and also an audit log for you know compliance. Pretty much, this is the operation that that it performs. Um, it also uses uh, AppCert support in both, da both databases. And its uh, program in Java uses uh, official uh, uh, drivers for both databases. So what is the performance that we found? While running on read committed isolation level um, for Postgres and uh, uh, transactions, I mean serializable, equivalent to serializable with MongoDB, this is the performance that we, that we experienced. So basically, we can see here that in terms of transactions, uh, we get a significantly higher number of transactions with Postgres across all the concurrency levels that we were experiencing. Why we were checking here with different number of concurrency levels? Uh, well, the main reason is that uh, we wanted to see how conflicts may arise, and we'll see that later because uh, when, when you are performing concurrent operations, depending on the isolation level that you experience, some transactions may need to be rolled back. Um, if they cause a serializ uh, seri um, serialization error, which means that those two operations cannot be ordered in such a way there will be a serial uh, ordering of those events, then one needs to be aborted and retried. This retried can be more or less automatic. Um, it's actually automatic in, in, in MongoDB case. Um, the application supported uh, for Postgres, and, and you'll get, uh, of course, it will be slower, the overall effect, because you're, you've done some work that is now is not paying off. So we tested different uh, scenarios in terms of concurrency. And uh, well, the, the performance is basically uh, one order of, of magnitude larger. Uh, it was around 14 times faster, Postgres uh, on, on read and committed, sorry, uh, read committed. Now, what about serializable? We may say that this is not fair test, this previous one, because MongoDB is offering a serializable isolation level, whereas Postgres is only using read committed. So we repeated the test, including, and this is also one flag of the program to run the benchmark, uh, we repeat also the results for serializable. Um, it doesn't change the picture, picture significantly. Uh, Postgres is obviously a bit slower compared to uh, uh, serializable because they're in serializable isolation level, there's basically no retries. There's no uh, uh, transactions being rolled back. But in, post in, in, in serializable, there are in Postgres, both in, Mos in Postgres and MongoDB. Now, let's look a little bit at the numbers, because there are some of those which are quite interesting. So um, if we look under uh, 
we analyzed and, and the, uh, this benchmark that we developed captures the number of retries that you're performing, uh, that the application is performing because of the serializable isolation level. And this, of course, affects performance. So if you look at the numbers for the retries on this uh, serializable isolation level you know, with the concurrency, with, with obviously low concurrency, there is no retries. Well, with one thread, there cannot be any retries because there's only one thread, right? As, as long as we start increasing concurrency, the number of retries, of course, starts growing and the performance goes down. Now, if we look at the absolute numbers, we might think that Postgres is doing many more retries per second. Uh, if we look at, for example, 128, Postgres is doing 118 retries, whereas MongoDB is only doing four. But the reality is that this is an absolute number. If we make it relative to the number of uh, transactions that we are eventually executing, we basically see that the number of retries is, is quite similar. It goes on a percentage level on a similar scale on, on both databases. But in this case, Postgres is performing so, much, so many more transactions per second. This leads us to believe that uh, the, and this is partially according to the documentation of MongoDB 4.0, and I believe it has been improved MongoDB 4.2, that uh, the transaction uh, retry mechanism, the detection mechanism for MongoDB transaction retries is a bit more coarse-grained than, than in, in Postgres. This would make sense anyway. Transactions in Postgres have been there for ages, more than 20 years. Uh, whereas in MongoDB, we were introduced just months before we, we run this, this, this effort. So maybe the cost. I'm not an expert on that, that, that level. But what about latency? Well, a, a benchmark just talking about throughput, about number of operations per second, is, is like saying nothing, right? Um, that tells us a, an average number over a duration of many minutes, hours of the test duration. But what is the experience? from the users, especially this is targeting OLTP workloads, transactional workloads, maybe a website. How much time are our users waiting for the result of a given query? So we need to analyze the, the, the latency of those queries. How, what is the time that this, those queries took? And then we compare the latencies here, the percentiles. The percentiles, 50 percentile, 99 percentile, 99.9, .9, and so forth, which basically represent uh, at which point uh, what is the duration of the, for example, if we're talking about the 99 percentile, what is the duration of the 100th uh, slowest query? What we see here is that if we look at Postgres latencies, um, they, they are, for, ex for except for the 99.9 .9, uh, latency case percentile, they are pretty much almost under 10 milliseconds, which is pretty good in general for a database that is performing around uh, uh, 15,000, 20,000 transactions per second, and is delivering consistently at a latency almost below 10 milliseconds, which again is, is pretty good. And only in the worst case, which is 99.99 percentile, percentile on, on the highest level of concurrency, can grow over 100 milliseconds. In other words, this means that out of 1,000 queries, only one is slower than 100 milliseconds, and the rest are faster than that. In general, it's, it's probably a very good result. If we look at, at MongoDB, um, the latencies are significantly higher. Even without latency, even without concurrency, the minimum latency that we get is around 10 milliseconds. And then it grows uh, up to uh, you know, over 100 milliseconds, and worst case, uh, with the highest level of concurrency, uh, significant number of queries are executing uh, up to a one second latency. So it's also a, approximately one order of magnitude bigger latency, higher latency than, than Postgres. Okay, that was transactions. What about OLTP? OLTP conceptually is, this, is the same. Transactions benchmark was also a, uh, an OLTP benchmark. But in this case, we are not using transactions. So we're comparing what MongoDB has had from the very beginning in terms of capabilities. With Postgres, we run transactions, but it will run on repeatable read mode. For this benchmark, we wanted to use, instead of writing our own benchmark, which we had to write for the uh, transactions benchmark because there was, there was nothing that could compare both databases with support for transactions, we decided to use an industry standard benchmark which is well known and trusted, which is called Sysbench. Again, as I mentioned before, there's other options which we evaluated them all and discarded for several reasons. Example of why CSB, because of not using any workload that resembles nothing that you would use in production and, and a few others. 
Um, it supports both databases. Um, uh, through Mongo, it supports uh, via driver that was also part of the criticism that MongoDB performed of this, of this benchmark, uh, which is a non-app premier platform for MongoDB and maybe an outdated driver, um, which is uh, fair enough. Um, but again, uh, first of all, it's really hard to find a benchmark that is trusted, that supports both databases, both data models, and that was provide adequate for this kind of benchmark. And second, in, in our opinion, well, you know, if, if, you, if you create these versions, if you publish these drivers, very likely you should continue, you know, developing them accordingly. But anyway, this benchmark is also open source. All, our, our code that uh, fires up the, um, the infrastructure is, is open source too, and, and you might want to swap it for another benchmark if you like. It's very easy to do that. So again, we used uh, in memory database, in memory test, and uh, on this test, we also use different workloads, read and write, with 50-50 uh, and 95-5 splits, different file system, XFS and CFS, and different levels of concurrency. Let me digress just a little bit about Postgres connection pooling. We decided to benchmark with and without Postgres connection pooling. Why? Because, and coming from the Postgres world, it's very f small the number of customers we tell them not to use a connection pool in front of Postgres. You almost always, if you use Postgres, need a connection pooler. And remember that one of the premises of this benchmark is to resemble what people do in production. Well, people in production use a connection pooler. So is this fair? Well, we can discuss that, uh, whether this is fair for one database or another one. But definitely, this is how people use Postgres. MongoDB uh, basically has a, a different model, which is a threading model. So it does not suffer the consequences of high concurrency and their workloads uh, without a connection pooler. And uh, also, the drivers of MongoDB include a form of client connection pooling, too. So um, we didn't see any specific needs to front end MongoDB by a connection pooler, but we felt the need to do that with Postgres. The reason why Postgres does not perform well or that typically requires a connection puller in front is that because of being a process model instead of a thread model, um, it has a lot of overhead on creating connections. And not because of only that, because every process has its own cache, uh, which is kind of leaning on the heavy side. It's like around 10 megabyte cache per process. Think about 1,000 pro uh, processes. That's already 10 gigabytes of RAM. Um, and, and also because of the way the cache, the shared buffers work, and so forth. So actually, there's, uh, we came up uh, with, a, with a formula with the, we used to estimate the optimum number of uh, connections that he should hit Postgres, which is this formula. I'll not get into the details here. But you know, it, it is an important fact. But anyway, we provide results with or and without connection pooling. So this is the result for the uh, what we call the fit test, the one that is uh, four gigabyte that fits totally in memory, uh, and this shows the operations per second uh, for 50 users in different workloads, XFS, EFS, and in all cases we found Postgres to be uh, several times faster than than MongoDB. Uh, mind you that this is under the number of users uh, that um, you know we found optimal performance. Because here we're not trying to set up different levels of concurrency, but because you would front Postgres by a connection pooler, you will find what is the optimal number of connections, and you will always go through this connection pooler, and it will always go through with this number of connections, which will be optimal for the database. So uh, in some sense, we were tuning Postgres here for the opt optimal workload, but it's because it really needs it, and it's because production workload will always run this way will not run differently than this way. But it will also results without this with different levels of users. Um, and this is the, the graph that resembles this. And here we can see very clearly this positive effect of the connection pooling. Um, here you can see in this graph, uh, with a varying number of concurrent users, how Postgres performs. And you can see that in the optimal level, which for this benchmark is uh, 50, Postgres performed this several times faster than MongoDB. But under different concurrent workloads, it is s several times as lower than MongoDB. Now, if you use a connection pooler like PG, uh, PG Bouncer, Postgres performs at the top performance almost all the time. Because PG Bouncer kind of acts as a buffer and queues the queries and only drives to Postgres the uh, number of connections that are required to keep it performing under the ideally operating performance and then queues the rest. So this A shows how Postgres almost always requires a connection pooler in front and B 
how performance may vary, and that in this case, except for the uh, tuned number of uh, concurrent users, otherwise MongoDB would be faster, several times faster. Now, what about on disk? Um, our previous experience, which uh, dates uh, to the uh, times of uh, MongoDB 3.2, um, we saw the effect that uh, MongoDB, um, you know, had performance drops with very large databases. Um, <clears throat> we're not talking about sharding, especially, by the way, we didn't use sharding on this benchmark with MongoDB. Uh, first of all, because there's not a directly equivalent in-core solution for Postgres sharding. B, because this was done with MongoDB 4.0, which didn't support transactions across shards, whereas MongoDB 4.2 supports them. Well, I might want to update this at the later time with uh, MongoDB 4.2 and include sharding there. But anyway, on a single node, a single replica, a single shard, MongoDB uh, typically uh, experience some, some uh, performance degradation on, start on large databases. Postgres, uh, not so much. So in this case, the performance difference was significantly higher uh, under, this, under these scenarios. And last but not least, the OLAP benchmark. So if we recap, uh, the transaction benchmark is a, tr is a benchmark we wrote ourselves. The OLTP benchmark, we took a sysbench, which is an industry standard, but uh, maybe could be argued that the driver quality for MongoDB was not the optimal from MongoDB perspective. So one of the, the keys in order to try to also be as fair as possible on this benchmark, we decided to make the OLAP benchmark one that came native, kind of, from the MongoDB world, and compare Postgres in a sub uh, with Postgres in a suboptimal way. So in this case, for this benchmark, we use the GitHub Archive, which is a JSON dataset. JSON is pretty native to MongoDB, and it's not a JSON database, but it resembles document model, and there's a direct translation, whereas Postgres is not a JSON or document database, but has JSON support. It is much less efficient that, for example, ten, taking this JSON and converting them to a relational structure. And this is the result that we actually achieved with ToroDB, where we uh, found Postgres with pure relational model hundreds of times faster than a uh, document model. But anyway, again, we wanted to lean uh, for this benchmark on, on a data set that is natural to MongoDB, not natural to Postgres, and compare, for the, for, for, compare the performance here. Uh, we chose a not very large database for OLAP. Typically, we should have picked a, a larger one, but you know, time and resource constraints were they were. So we anyway st stuck with uh, uh, 200 million records, which is anyway not that small number uh, of records from again GitHub Archive, is a public data set, and uh, this turned out to to use 200 gigabytes of data space in MongoDB, a bit more in Postgres because storage of JSON in Postgres is a bit more verbose. And then what we perform is just a series of BI queries. So BI, business intelligence, means you know I want to find out some information about this data. Like this is uh, information about GitHub, so who are the top contributors, who is the user that has created more commits, or equivalent like this. So um, the queries, you might think that you know they're ideal or not less ideal. But again, this is all open source. It's all open. Go to the uh, repo, you write your own query, and, and rerun the results. But we believe they, they were reasonable questions you may ask at the GitHub Archive data set. So we ran four queries on time, the results of these queries. It's typically long running queries that scan a significant amount of the data and give us insights. So the queries look like this. Also, you can compare the syntax of the two uh, different systems. So this is, for example, query A. I'm not going to get into the details. I want to have some time for questions. But uh, these are the results. So on these results, we found uh, MongoDB to be faster uh, on query A, and uh, Postgres to be faster on the other three queries. The, the margins in this case are smaller than in the other benchmarks, which means they perform more or less similar. And obviously, these results may be different from you know if you run different queries uh, on, on, on different data sets. sets. What I would have liked to do here is to run with larger data sets, uh, because typically this analytics, this BI system, will will talk about definitely terabyte size database. And and again, uh, if if we come back to this point, I would like to use uh, MongoDB 4.2 and use uh, sharding, and then compare with some of the non-in-core solutions for Postgres that uh, support sharding, like for example Citus. So that was, that was pretty much what I wanted to say. Um, so I'll open up for questions.
answer. Uh, thank you. We all know that uh, these uh, benchmarks uh, caused a big reaction from Mongo. So can you please comment uh, their point of view and how they think, uh, like, is it, like, what is, what, what, what do they think and how you, you think about what they think, right? Okay, okay, that's a, it's a potentially very long answer. Um, first thing I would say, go to uh, our blog site. Uh, you'll find there the uh, the links to the all the repos and all the all the source code that we wrote. The initial uh, white paper that we wrote, we wrote a 60, 50 something pages white paper about this benchmark, explaining everything, all the details, all the numbers, and also the links to the S3 repository with all the results, and also initial MongoDB blog post response. Uh, which was not linked on the main blog site of MongoDB, but we linked it, and then our response blog post. There was no follow-up to that one. Um, but anyway, to, to answer your question. So first of all, uh, MongoDB in general believed that this benchmark was not um, appropriately done in general. They uh, did the benchmark themselves and ran and got so, so uh, improved numbers, especially, for example, on the OLAP test, on the OLAP benchmark. Um, and, and also claim that some indexes were missing on some, some parts. Our response is that mainly, you know, everything that we have done, we have done in the open. So, you know, if, if they felt that there was something wrong, the ideally response should have been, okay, this is how we have fixed it or how we have done this. And that was not published. So MongoDB response didn't say how they got this, those numbers what indexes they were missing, what uh, tuning they did to the database. Um, so our response is, you know, it's not that we disbelieve that those numbers were not achievable, but we question how they were achieved because they were not made public. So if you say, you know what, we can make better than you, these are our numbers, but actually not on the blog post, but on some Twitter comments, some official person from MongoDB said, it's so obvious that uh, this benchmark is wrong, and our numbers are so right that we're not even going to explain how, it, how we did it. And our response was, be transparent. You know, if, if you believe we made some mistakes, we will take, we'll take those very, uh, very seriously, and we'll improve the benchmark, submit a merge request, and, and, and fix the benchmark. Anyway, um, we also elaborated our response and, and try to understand what MongoDB was trying to say and why we didn't agree with those responses. So, um, for example, because they didn't say, but uh, at some point for the OLAP queries, MongoDB was suggesting to create a specific indexes that would certainly improve the performance of those queries. But on a typical OLAP scenario, you don't know what queries the users are gonna execute. They're gonna ask some information. You cannot create a specific indexes to for those queries, that, that's gaming the benchmark, right? Um, but anyway, I wish, and I know there's some MongoDB people here in the room, that there would be a follow-up to this, and they will provide source code with improvements with this benchmark, which will be very happy to publish updated results or more comments. I would love to follow on that conversation. You know, our goal is not to discredit anyone here, but rather to provide information and insights on, on performance, and if there's something that can be improved, and I'm sure there's something that could be improved, we haven't found yet yet, uh, we'll be happy to do that. Thank you, Alvaro, uh, for perfect uh, benchmark report, but um, just to step back to AWS uh, setup, so you mentioned that uh, you use something like M5, uh, 4X, large, and so on and so on. But what region of AWS did you use? Uh, oh, for Postgres? For, for AWS region. Um, ah, US, region. Europe, this was, Asia. I think this was US. US. And uh, uh, did you notice any change of performance of AWS instances during the day? Something like during the night it's faster? Two times faster than during the working days, busy days? Ah, n n no, it's in the results. N not significantly. Th there was some performance difference in, in AWS one day, but that didn't affect our own benchmarks when they uh, apparently started upgrading the firmware 
of the servers to support uh, the patches for the CPU microcode that uh, fixes the problems with the Spectre uh, meltdown and all that. That is, uh, was a significant performance hit. Um, but we were not hit by those. Anyway, we ran hundreds and hundreds of benchmarks, and the results were usually averaged, uh, discarding the extremes, and, and so forth. Because as of now, we have some problems with benchmarking of Postgres on AWS and US, uh, essentially because uh, performance varies two times. So it's quite heavy to uh, compare. Yes, results. I, mean, I mean, in AWS, in an internet region in general, you might have no noisy neighbors, right? Um, the only way to fix that problem is to use bare metal instances. But okay. that was definitely out of our budget. And, and can you just come back to the slide of uh, AWS instances? Yep, absolutely. Uh, yes, here. Yeah. Uh, uh, did you try to use anything uh, a different uh, model uh, with uh, uh, good network performance? Because we have some problems with M54X because it's up to 10 and actually it varies from 1 to 4 GB during the day. It's quite um, no, so we, we run on this on this hardware um, and, you know, uh, it's true that the performance is up to 10. It might be less, and usually it's less than that. Uh, it varies, but uh, that's why we use, uh, it says there, IO1 volumes. And IO1 volumes are warranted, um, warranted IO apps uh, with a strong SLA. So, yeah, if you use GP2, so GP2 is, is a kind of this you should not use for benchmarking. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with GP2 disk, but they, they have variable performance. They're called variable performance, which of course is bad for a benchmark. Um, so you might be experiencing two effects. One, that there's no warranted SLA on the disk performance, whereas with IO1 it is. By, by the way, these disks were one of the main factors of the cost of this benchmark. Because a terabyte, terabyte size disk of, of IO1 volumes with the, I don't know, it was 10 or 15K IOPS is very expensive, in the order of thousands of dollars per month, just one disk. Um, they warranty performance with a 9.99.5, uh, I believe, SLA. GP2, there's no SLA on, on that regards. And also, it can go faster or, or slower depending on the number of credits and the size of the volume. Thank you for the speech. I was curious about uh, the slide with the uh, in-memory tests with uh, two file systems with different results. <clears throat> but not so much different. So the question is about uh, something other. Maybe I, I was lost too. Uh, there were a transaction and not transaction uh, load uh, in the vault and uh, in your intro. And uh, these results are only transactional, if I'm right. Or not transactional, but only one uh, type of, tr of results. Uh, is there a second t uh, type of results? I think non-transactional. Same yeah. set of, of results, but uh, not, not serializable, but uh, read committed. No, not transaction, but non-transaction. Uh -huh. OK, I see. So um, we did OLTP with Sysbench, which uh, in MongoDB was not using transactions. In, in Postgres was using transactions because there's no other way around. And, and so those are non-transactional on MongoDB. Transactional, I mean multi-document transactions when I speak about, about MongoDB. Um, and the benchmark that we wrote, we didn't run on MongoDB without transactions. We only uh, run it with transactions. And Postgres both with read committed and serializable. The numbers you cannot compare directly because they are two different benchmarks. The, the operations and the data set that Sysbench uses is different from the one that we generate for the flight uh, reservation system. Thanks. A couple of additional questions about this uh, performance predictability. Why didn't you use uh, local NVMe disks like i3 nodes? And second, uh, did you control uh, steal time in, in your benchmarks? Uh, what was the second? Steal, steal time. Uh, it's, uh, if, you, if you run IOSTAT or TOP, uh, it shows how much st uh, time was stolen by other versions. Okay, yes, yeah, got it. All right, so why we didn't use NVMe? That would have been great. Um, but there was, a, there was a timing question and a, a cost, uh, a, a timing and a cost answer. So first of all, we wanted to resemble how people run these workloads in production. 
And uh, for production workload, it's typically recommended that you use network disks. But costs are uh, you, sh you, you, you may mitigate uh, costs using uh, uh, spot instances. Yeah, obviously right. we use the spot instances. Right. Yeah. Um, so it's not, but it's not expensive. Yeah. No, but uh, by using, an, first of all, so with a network disk, you experience, uh, you, you resemble what most people use in production. Uh, if you use local disks, you may run into trouble when you have a, a failure of that node, right? Because the, the data vanishes. You need to rely on replication. Replication typically is asynchronous, can incur in data loss, so forth. So it's typically recommend you know this to use network disk. On top of that, by using network disk, we can we can leverage the snapshots, which was were extremely useful for us because we're playing with two terabyte data sets. And you know, if you want to rerun benchmarks and create instances and refresh them and so forth, with snapshots is 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 much better in that in that regards. Regarding the I.O. stolen time, I don't have numbers on my head, but we are, every benchmark had a SAR being run, and there's the SAR statistics there. So it can be checked, and they are published to the S3 repository, which contains all the benchmark results. So there's the whole SAR information there. So the presentation time is over, but you still have an opportunity to talk to Alvaro outside in the discussion zone, and uh, now choose, please, the best one. The best question. Uh, okay, I, I I believe in this case I need to pick a non-technical question followed by several technical questions, <laughs> which is that gentleman over there um, triggered my longest response. So thank you, thank you. Thank for the you, questions. thank you, Alvaro, for your great job and report. Thank you.